right, good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 4, welcoming all of our friends and church family that are streaming with us live. Glad to have you with us. And by the way, we would love to have you at the breakfast next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been in the church family, and we invite you, just call our secretary this week, Tuesday through Friday, or leave a message at night and say, hey, I'm bringing three, I'm bringing four. As many as you that want to come, come, and we'll accommodate it. We'll do it one way or another. We'll fill that room. We'll fill another room, but we welcome everybody, all right? And that includes everyone here. So Colossians chapter 4, we're winding down to the end of Colossians. This is such a rich passage here, beginning with verse 7. And it says there, Paul's writing, of course, to the believers in Colossae, and he's encouraging them because Paul has all of these helpers. Paul has all of these people on fire for God. They've been set ablaze like we sang about. And he's got these helpers. And in verse 7, it says there, this, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and by the way, that's another word for servant. It doesn't mean like he's a, a preacher up in front of a crowd. He's minister is, you know, servant. It's a, it's a word that means slave, essentially. A great helper. Faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. So Tychicus is going to come and, and fill you in on what's going on with me. I'm in prison. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort or encourage your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. So you got Tychicus and Onesimus banding together, leaving Paul's presence, going all the way to Colossae to say, hey, we care about you, little church in Colossae. We care about the sheep. We care about your lives. We care about your families. Paul says, I want to know what's happening there, and I want them to know what's happening with me because I love them and I want to bless them. Now you go to verse 10. Another uh, servant, another fellow helper, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. With Mark, by the way, that's the author of the book of Mark, which m most people would say is the very first gospel that was written. All right, Mark was the first gospel, and then Matthew, Luke, and John, all right. So did it not, did not jump? Oh, I'm sorry, thanks. Okay, all right. Aristarchus, thank you. My fellow prisoner greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, there were tons of people in the early uh, first century, in that first century, that were named Jesus. You know, it's just like the name Mary, the name Joseph, tons of people. They didn't, they didn't have names like today where you've got eight gazillion names, okay? They had a number of names, and that's what you pick from. Most of them right straight out of the Bible. <laughs> and so some of these that are stranger, like Aristarchus, these are people that are Gentiles. They're, they're from far away from Israel. These are not non-Jewish, and that's why Tychicus, Aristarchus, they sound... You know, it sounds so different, you know. It's like my last name, Vesendak, you know. I've, I've had to repronounce that nine million times in my lifetime. You know, my dad's brother, he was kind of a smart guy. He, he just said, phooey. He said, I'm tired of having to repeat this. So he goes to court and he changes his, our, his last name to Vance, V-A-N-C. He said, but anyway, so nonetheless, my name is kind of strange. Why? Because my ancestors are from... Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. And so, anyway, but, you know, it's not Bob uh, Whitehouse or something, you know, or something like that. <laughs> All right, so, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, Jesus, verse 11, who is called Justice, so they called him Justice because they wanted to reserve the name Jesus among the brethren at, for, uh, for Jesus Christ. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, all right? They're the only ones that are Jewish. They have proved to be a comfort to me, and I bet, because you know what? Paul went to the Jew first. Whenever he went to a new city, he went to the synagogue, to the Jew first. They're the ones that God ordained 
all the way back to Abraham to be his light to the world, and they deserve to hear the truth first because they are the apple of God's eye. Now, God doesn't love them more than the rest of the world, but they're just special to God in that way, all right? And so Paul goes to them first, but he says, you know, not, you know what? Not a lot of converts. These are my only, or I should say this, maybe they had the converts, but they didn't have the workers that were Jewish. They are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, or are, Jewish, or are Jewish. They have proved to be an encouragement to me, I bet. And then here in the last couple of verses, Epaphras, another kind of strange Gentile name, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervent for you, fervently for you in prayers. By the way, do we have some fervent prayer warriors out here? You know, you look at the prayer list, you use other lists, you have your own list. Are you fervent in prayer? By the way, Gary, Janie, we love you. We know you're listening from the hospital room. And are you praying for Gary and Janie and other people that are suffering? Last night I found out from one of my daughter's friends that her dad has found out out of the blue that he's got stage 4 um, pancreatic cancer. Her mom has hyperthyroidism. And she asked Kelly and I last night, she said, would you please pray for my mom and dad? There's a lot of people that need our prayers, physically and spiritually, right? A lot of people that should be here today, and you know what's happened? COVID has just basically grabbed them, put all kinds of fear in them, and they haven't been to church since a year ago, March, or something like that. That's not what should be happening. And you know what? I'm sorry that if you don't feel that way, but you know what? There, there's something about being among God's people. Unless you're laid up in a hospital bed like Janie is and Gary's there at her side to assist her day after day after day. You should be here and next Sunday when we have that big kickoff dinner and have one of our missionaries from, from uh, Cambodia come, you should be here. No more excuses. No more excuses. Okay. So, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect, mature, teleos. You may stand mature and complete in all the will of God. That's our will for you. By the way, again, uh, the verse in the Bible is God's command. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together like some do, but encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day of Jesus, the rapture, approaching. I bear him witness, Epaphras, that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those who are in Hierapolis. You'll remember, remember you've got Colossae, you've got Laodicea, you've got Hierapolis and a little triangle right next to each other. So there's a lot of ministry going on there. Well, let's start off with a story. Does anybody like stories? I like stories. Every marriage, right, has its share of trials and troubles and all kinds of problems. But let me just tell you this. This, this couple takes the cake. <laughs> this, when I read this, I'm like, I can't believe that what they went through. Now, the good thing is, is they must have had a lot of money because on their honeymoon, they decided to go from Sweden where they lived on a four-month Holly, uh, Hollywood, four-month honeymoon. woo -hoo! I mean, hey, listen, one week's great, two weeks is amazing. Four months? Boy, that's great. Hey, uh, hey boss, uh, I'm taking off, and I'll see you in about uh, a long time. Okay, so anyway, it's like, okay, church family, I'm going on a vacation. It's, uh, it's May. I'll see you in September. Bye. <laughs> yeah, but they, you know, they, yeah, they must have owned a business and been doing real well, so they planned this four-month honeymoon all over the world. It's really amazing. And, uh, but amaz uh, imagine going off on your honeymoon and listen to this. They experienced six major disasters on their honeymoon. Six 
major natural disasters. I'm going to enumerate them for you right now. Their names were Stefan and Erika Svanström. And when they left Stockholm, Sweden for their four-month honeymoon... <laughs> Okay, I needed some laser, okay. Woo. Okay, so they left in December of 2010. What happened, okay? They get to Munich, Germany. Guess what happens in Munich, Germany? This. One of the worst snowstorms to hit Munich in who knows how long, okay? Then they finally get out, dig themselves out of Munich, and they go to Australia, the city of Cairns in Australia. I had to look that up. I'm like, hey, Siri, how do you pronounce this word? Cairns, Kearns, Cairns. I'm like, come on, Bubba. I don't know, what do they say, bloke? Can't you pronounce it just one way? I can't, you know, they're telling me 18 different. Okay, Cairns, Australia, in the city, they get there. And what happens in Cairns? They're struck by one of the most unbelievable tornadoes that has hit there in who knows how long, okay? One of the most ferocious tornadoes in Australia's history. Okay, they say, let's drive to the other side of, to, of, the other side of uh, Australia, uh, to Brisbane, okay? To Brisbane. And so, in, in America, we call it Brisbane, but I look that one up too, and it's like Brisbane. <laughs> and so, or something like that. But they get there, and what does Brisbane have? They have this. Massive flooding. Look at the statue there in the square. <laughs> How deep's that water? Deep, deep, you know? This fake God is standing there like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's because he's like Dagon. He's the one that gets tipped over by God Almighty because he's a fake. But anyway, so nonetheless, you know, they're on the other side of Australia and they're there to enjoy their honeymoon and boom, they get hit with this. So then they say, okay, what are we going to do here? Let's go to another part of Australia. And they get hit with, um, uh, uh, fla uh, not flash floods, but they get hit with wildfires in that place. Smoke everywhere. This is, this is unbelievable. You know, one time Kelly and I went on vacation for two weeks, and it rained every day, all day long. And so I told Kelly, her mom and dad, they were out there, and I said, why don't you stay an extra week? Maybe you'll get some sun. I'll just, I have to go back to work. And so this was over a cr long Christmas break, and a long time ago. And so she stayed there, and guess what? It rained for seven straight more days. They had a monsoon. And so it was just crazy. That happens. That happens. Okay, so finally, they get to New Zealand. They get to New Zealand, and no kidding. They get hit with a 6.3 Richter earthquake. That basically destroys, I mean, guess what? My nephew was living in New Zealand, and they booted him out. He was there working a long time. He lived there for a long time. Now, he wasn't a, a, a citizen, but they said, uh, sorry, you've got to go back to America because we've lost all kinds of jobs, and New Zealanders get them first. So Americans, get out of here. Okay. Then... They went on to Japan, and the same thing. Japan's rocked with a gigantic... This, listen, I am not kidding you. This is happening, okay? Tokyo, largest earthquake and tsunami on record, and this poor couple from Sweden is there to experience it, okay? Finally, they left in December. It's now March 29th, 2011, March 29th just a little over 10 years ago. And uh, they, they got back to Stockholm. Oh, isn't that beautiful? My question is, why'd they leave to begin with? <laughs> Look at that place. Oh, my goodness. Kelly? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, that's beautiful. So they get back after their honeymoon, and much calmer. Well, actually, they made it to China, and China was fine. Okay, China was fine. So, looking back on the trip, this is what Mrs. Svanstrom said. Quote, To say we were unlucky with the weather doesn't really cover it. It's so absurd that now we can only laugh. But Mr. Svanstrom noted that the marriage was still going strong. He said, quote, 
We've certainly experienced more than our fair share of catastrophes, but the most important thing is that we're together and we're happy. That's the most important thing. Now, that's the story. So what do we draw from that, everybody? Well, as terrible, as awful as these disasters were for them on their honeymoon, I'm sure that Mrs. Swanstrom, uh, Swanstrom was glad that she had her brand new husband close to her side throughout that whole ordeal. And I bet that Mr. Svonstrom was glad that his wife was at his side. You know what? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, in fact, I heard this verse quoted last night, two are better than one. <laughs> two are better than one. Remember Adam and Eve? It's not good for a man to be alone. Yeah. And then it goes on to say in three, okay, add a child into the mix, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And add several more children. Hey, back in those days when there was no social security, you know what? It was an awesome thing to have a giant family because, man, you could keep working, you could keep tilling the ground, and as you got older and couldn't do it so soon, you know, you got your 16, 18, 17-year-old son, here, son, here, you're the plowman now, and I'm just going to spread seeds. <laughs> you're going to do the heavy duty. And you know what? Then the older girls can help take care of the new babies. And they, they were amazing. And they replenished the earth because they had to. All right? And so two is better than one, and a threefold cord is not easily, easily broken. So you say, Pastor Bob, what does this have to do with the price of tea in China? We read about Paul and all these different people that were helping him and blessing him and encouraging him, and he was encouraging them, and they were all working together like a, a finely uh, uh, knitted rope that was strong. Why? Because the question today that's before us, not question, but the exhortation is this, you can't do it alone, and neither can I. You can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. I want to be a great Christian. I want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Guess what? I, wait a minute, Pastor Bob, surely you can do it alone. Surely you can grow and be strong. And I, No, I can't. No, I can't, and neither can any of us. Adam couldn't do. He was perfect. Adam was perfect. When God created him, he didn't have a sinful nature, okay? He, he, he wasn't, he was innocent. He had never sinned. And he started naming all the animals and you go on and on. But God looked down and said, something's not right about this. Something's not right. I'll make him a helper, complementary to him. A helper that will complement him. I'm so thankful that God gave me Kelly. You know why? Because we're different. We're different. And you know what? Her amazing intellect and her amazing love for God, it, it files down the things in my life that I need filed down and, and I, things I, areas I need to be encouraged and vice versa. That's the way it is. Not nine times out of ten, you marry somebody that's kind of like your polar opposite. You know, that's why you get books like, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Okay? So really, if a woman had written that book, it would say, men are from Pluto. <laughs> they're, they're out there. And women are from Venus, you know? You know? And that's probably true. So anyway, Paul couldn't do it by, on on his own and neither can we we need each other and by the way you that are tuning in with us you know what you cannot stand before the Lord Jesus and hear him say well done good and faithful servant if you never are with your brothers and sisters there's a good chance that you'll fail God and be ashamed at him be ashamed of him at his judgment seat because this or that or this or that or this excuse or that excuse it's keeping you from honoring God the way you need to be, giving to God, honoring God, being among God's people and encouraging those that need encouragement and helping those who need help and so forth. You know, we all need to hear this. I need to hear this. You know, I'm a sinner like all of you, and I need 
to get hit by God's spirit and say, hey, come on, uh, uh, knock it up, come on, get going. You need to do what God's calling you to do. So the title today, You Can't Do It Alone, we're going to pray and we're going to jump right into this amazing passage. Father, thank you for bringing us together, Father. Oh, Lord, we need, Lord, to you, you to work in all of our hearts today because, Lord, we're sheep. All we like sheep go astray. We turn everyone to our own way. And that is so true, Lord. And Lord, you love all of us. And yet, Lord, that doesn't mean that you're happy with all of us. So please speak to hearts, Lord. Please help us to see that we can't do it alone, and neither can our brothers and sisters, and that they need us. And we pray these things in your precious name, and for your sake, Lord Jesus. Amen. In his book, The Gift of the Church, Jim Samra quoted Augustine. Now, Augustine lived just a few hundred years after Jesus, but he was brilliant, and he was uh, just God brought him to himself just in an amazing, amazing... The story, I won't go into it very, very long, but he's walking down the street, and he's just fed up with his worldliness and his carnality, and he hears a child in a house chanting, tole lego, tole lego, it's in, it's in uh, Latin. <clears throat> and he, that means take and read, take and read. <laughs> what did that mean in his mind? He felt like God was telling him, take God's word and read it. So what happens? Where does he turn to? Turns to the book of Romans. Man. And he reads, you know, the, the, the uh, just shall live by faith. <laughs> you know, and he learns about justification and so on. Well, nonetheless, St. Augustine said centuries ago, he said, look, Mother Church is in labor. Okay, he's talking about the body of Christ. Mother Church is in labor. She is groaning in travail to give birth to you. Okay, that's kind of abstract. We don't really figure it out, but this is what the author who put this quote in his book, this is what he said about it. Samra said, quote, How does the church provide the nurture, care, and maturation for spiritual growth? God gives us the church to help us form our identity as Christians. The church helps us to endure suffering, bringing comfort and encouragement in difficult times. The church nourishes with the Word and the Lord's Supper, provides godly examples for us to imitate, and, everybody listening, disciplines us when we go astray. In addition, we grow and are transformed as Jesus is uniquely manifested in our worship assemblies. The church provides maternal care. Remember Paul said in one of his epistles, I can't recall it, I think it was Thessalonians. He says, I love you with the love of a mother. I love you. I love you like a mother cherishes her child. Yeah. Yeah, we need to have that. In fact, this is what I'm talking about, about rubbing off on one another. You know, if a man and a wife, they get married, and the man's always brusque, and he's always chafing, and he never has any kind of like compassion, and he never has an edge on him, I don't mean you ha a person has to become effeminate and act like a, a woman. In fact, I would, I would say, hey, don't do that. But I'm just saying is, you know what? A godly wife ought to rub off on a man where that man has compassion. Jesus looked at the city and he wept for Jerusalem and he had compassion on it. He looked at all those people, all of them going the wrong way, all of them going down the tubes, and he just broke into, into tears because all these people were lost. All these people were headed for a Christless eternity and he knew it. A lot of times we forget about that. We, we look around and we see people like trees walking. What do you see there? Ah, oh, a bunch of trees walking around. <laughs> we don't see clearly. 
And Jesus has to touch our eyes and he says, now what do you see? Oh, I see all men clearly. Yeah, they are headed to hell, the vast majority. They, are, they do need me. They do need my love. They do need my witness. They do need my compassion. And hey, listen to me, everybody, all of you. You can make an impact. You can make an impact. Look, Virginia, hi, Virginia, back there. You know what? Look at Virginia. She's pushing a walker. She's having trouble. She had a stroke, and she can't walk right now. But you know what? What is she doing? She's living in that uh, assisted living, and she's, got, she's bringing friends with her to church. What are we doing? What are we doing? She got saved and on the right road through our homeless ministry in 2011 that we started or somewhere back then. And you know what? Here she is, become more and more mature and knows she needs to bring people to hear the good news, to hear how to be saved, to hear how to follow God after you get saved. And you know what? We need to get, we need to get set ablaze like we're saying, set me ablaze, set me ablaze, Lord. Please, Lord. I don't want to just go through life and, and, and just uh, fritter my life away. I want to do something for you, Lord. I want to love people. I want to use the talents you give me to love them, and I want to plant seeds, and then I want to give them the good news as well. I want to give them the good news. I want to get them to you. Man, we need this, everybody. So Samra said, the church provides maternal care for us in all of these ways helping us to grow to become more like Jesus. As we said earlier, Paul was not a loner. Are you a loner? Are you just content to be by yourself and watch TV all day long and fritter your life away? Then you're not Christ-like. You're not like Jesus. Jesus wasn't a loner. He had three close friends, all right, apostles, and then he had uh, a... a he had nine more that he was close to. And then at Pentecost, there was 120, you know, and then they just began more and more because those people grew and then they began to branch out and they began to branch out. And you get the idea. You get the idea. You can't do it alone. Paul needed Tychicus. Paul needed Onesimus. Paul needed Aristarchus. He needed all these guys, Epaphras, and they needed him, and we need each other. And so, everybody, let's be set ablaze. Let's be set ablaze. Let's make Jesus our way maker, to make a way, and for us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, Paul said this in verse 8. He said, I am sending him, Tychicus, to you and Onesimus, for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances. What's going on? They didn't have text. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have, a, what do you call it on the iPhone when you could look at the person you're talking to? FaceTime. They didn't have FaceTime. How cool would that have been? Paul sitting in prison. Hey, here. Look, everybody. Here's, here's everybody in the Colossi church. Awesome. How are they doing? You know, wouldn't that have been cool? But no, they had to go 500 miles or 2,000 miles on foot or boat or whatever and get there. And then nine months later, the message got back. It was snail mail. Man. But he went there to know their circumstances and to comfort. You know comfort is, it's, all, it's com being comforted when you're sad, but calm with communion with, calm with forte, strength, with strength. What are we to do to one another? With strength. Encourage each other. That's what comfort means. It means to comfort them with the sad, give them, give them strength. When, when they're happy, give them strength. Let them give you strength. <laughs> okay? You can't do it alone. Now, not only did Paul recognize that the Colossians needed the encouragement of their brothers and sisters, but he recognized that he needed their encouragement, as I've already said, just as much or maybe even more and that's why in verses 10 and 11, he tells the Colossians about three Jewish men, Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice. What does he say about them, everybody? Here's what he says. They have proved, I'm sorry, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me, to me. Yes, pastors, 
church secretaries, Mother's Day out leaders. Loretta down here. All the Mother's Day out teachers. All the different people that are teaching and, and, and getting worn out <laughs> by dozens and dozens of kids on a regular basis in a room full of infants. Yes. And everybody, just like you need encouragement, so do God's workers. And I love Paul said, they've proved to be an encouragement to me. So here's a, a lesson that we can draw from this, a theology. No matter how high you climb, no matter how high you climb in your service to God, you will always need the help and encouragement of others. You know what? Uh, from 1986 to, 19, uh, 1986 to 2008, you know what? I had one of the greatest mentors on earth that you could have, uh, who was Zane Hodges. He's, he was a professor of Greek and New Testament exegesis at Dallas Seminary from 1959 to 1986 for 27 years. And then he retired to go into writing. And man, am I glad he did, because he left behind some amazing books and I think his magnum opus, which he didn't even get to finish. He got all the way to Romans chapter 13, and the Lord took him home. People were going to his apartment right over here in Dallas off of I-80, and they went to his home where he had the Bible study on Sunday night, and they're knocking, knocking, no answer. Oh, Zane must have fallen asleep or something. So they go to the, the manager, and they get the keys, and Zane's laying on the, on the floor. Had a heart attack. His body on the floor, his soul, home with the Lord, born in 1932, went home at 76 in 19, or 2008. But you know what, everybody? When I came back from Florida, now 1992 to 2008, in fact, even before then, I was close to him all the way back as far as 1986. And you know what? It was an amazing, amazing influence on me. And to be able just to call him any time that I wanted to and say, hey, Zane, could you pray for me? Hey, Zane, could you uh, help me with this passage here? I'm a little bit shaky on this. I, I see what the Greek says, but you know what? I, I just don't get it. Why, why is it written this way? And, you know, he was so kind. Man, when I was, I was a young Christian, I was doubting my salvation. And guess what? I call him. I mean, this guy, he is just like way up here. I mean, like he's... He's got thousands of people that, you know, that are looking to him and following him and being mentored by him. And I call him out of the blue and say, hey, Zane, I need some help. I just read your book, The Gospel Under Siege, and I'm doubting my salvation. Can you help me? He spent three hours on the phone with me. Basically, on the, he didn't even know I was going to call. I didn't set up an appointment. He pushed his day aside, and he said, Bob, I'm going to talk to you as long as you need me to. Skips lunch. Yeah, why? He didn't, you know, he just barely knew me. He just barely knew me. But man, that started, when, and guess what, everybody? When he did that for me, I turned around and said, hey, Zane, I'll make your newsletters for you every month. I'll do your newsletters. You need me to typeset your books? I'll typeset your books. And so I got to typeset a few of his books. And how cool was that? To make them look cool and put things in there and graphics and get them to the printer. And, and then, you know, when he was writing his magnum opus at the end of his life, I'd always go to his, his apartment over here. He had an apartment he lived in, and he had an apartment he wrote in. And the one had all of his books and his computer. And every time I'd go, there's like, hey, Zane, do you, are you backing up the, the uh, commentary on Romans? <clears throat> uh, no, Bob, I uh, don't remember what you told me on how to do that. <laughs> and I said, okay, it's this easy. And I was showing him on this thumb drive, you know, I'm like, Zane, you do realize that what you have written for the last six months, if like your apartment caught on fire, everything you've done for six months would go up in the fire. Oh. <laughs> He's like, okay, you know, all he knew is just, hey, turn it on and do this. But you know what? Um, so I, I would back up everything in his office, all of the databases and everything for him and help him. And what a privilege, and you know what? How privileged I was at his funeral to be uh, a part of that funeral and to, to stand up at Tony Evans's church and share my heart about Zane, 
to read scripture and then to be followed by uh, other great men of God and, and Tony Evans uh, who did the eulogy, I mean did the sermon, the, the, the sermon. Oh, listen, I miss him so much. But you know what? God's given me other mentors. There's other people I can call. People that are higher than I in their maturity, higher than I in their intelligence. And I lean on them from time to time. You can't do it alone. Sean and Leanne Tui. Sean and Leanne Tui, they were the couple that the whole movie, The Blind Side, revolved around. Y'all seen The Blind Side with, uh, uh, oh, great. Yeah, it's so, uh, what's her name? Sandra Bullock, okay. I was going to say Sandra Lubbock. Sandra Bullock. Okay, what an amazing movie. What an amazing movie. And they're, they're the ones, they wrote this book. They're the real-life couple portrayed in The Blind Side. They shared the following story. They said this. There's a little-known congressional program that awards internships to young people who've aged out of the foster care system. These are kids who were never adopted and are no longer eligible for government support. A senator we've met employed one such man as an intern. One morning, the senator breezed in for a meeting and discovered that his intern was already in the office reorganizing the entire mailroom. The senator said to the intern, this is amazing. The mailroom has never looked so clean. You did a great job. <laughs> a few minutes later, the senator saw that intern and he had tears streaming down his face. And he said, son, are, are you okay? Yes, the intern answered quietly. Did, did I say something to offend you? He said, no, sir. No, sir. He said, well, what's wrong? And the young man said, that's the first time in my life anyone's told me that I did something good. That's the first time in my life that anyone's told me that I've done something good. It was none other than the great British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who said the following words, and I'm paraphrasing it to make it more 21st century friendly. <clears throat> Communion is strength, being together. Solitude is weakness. Solitude is weakness. Do you hear me? And alone, alone the old birch tree yields to the wind and lies flat on the ground. But in the forest, supporting each other, the trees laugh at the hurricane. The sheep of Jesus flock together. The social element is the genius of Christianity. And you know what? You may, not, you may think that not being here is no big deal. But God ordained that you be an encouragement to other people, and you're not doing that by not being here. You're not doing that. And you need to be ashamed of yourself. And you need to repent, and you need to get right with God. Now we turn to Paul's words to Epaphras. Verses 12 through 13. Epaphras was the spiritual leader in Colossians, if you'll remember, or Colossae, yeah, if you'll remember, going back to the beginning. Paul told the Colossians what a gift they had in Epaphras. This is what he said. Epaphras, who's one of you, a slave of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. By the way, everybody, just so you know, I'm not bragging. I just want you to know, every morning, maybe sometimes I don't do this on Saturdays, bright and early, sometimes I, I sleep in, but you know what, generally, all week long, Sunday mornings, I'm up, I get up 5 o'clock in the morning, and every day of my life, I walk, and I, when I say every day, I say generally every day, okay, I'm not, I'm not Superman, okay, Superman, no. okay, anyway, I'm not, but every day I get up for an hour, and I pray for your lives. I pray for your families. I pray for our, 
are prayerless. I walk around and I think of all those names and all the people and I spend an hour laboring fervently. Why? That you may stand mature. You know what I want for you? I want you to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And you're not going to hear it unless somebody's interceding for you because you're going to fall away and you're going to get lazy and you're going to get uh, all by yourself and you're not going to impact and make an impact on others. He has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis, that little triangular area. Let me ask you this. Are you zealous for anyone in prayer right now? I said zealous. You know, that's my first grandchild's middle name. Ethan Zeal Rawson. Ethan Zeal. I love it. You say, that's so weird. I think it's so biblical. I think it's awesome. I would have never named, I would never have thought to name my, if I ever had a son, I would have never thought to name him Zeal. But you know what? My daughter, Nicole, and her husband, you know what they want? They want a child that's going to be on fire for God. They want him to be extraordinary. They want him to be amazing. Well, anyway, are you zealous for anyone in prayer? Are, are you zealous for your spouse? Are you zealous for your family? Are you zealous for your co co-workers? Listen, you're working with people. or you're, you're, You are around people that some of them are going to spend eternity apart from Christ without you standing up. They're going to spend eternity apart from Christ. You may have children. You may have grandchildren that are going to be in those shoes. In great-grandchildren. You know what I pray for my grandchildren every day? Well, my, my grandson is a believer now. He's been saved, and he uh, loves the Lord. But my granddaughter is younger. And so every day I pray, Lord, bring Chloe to you in your perfect timing. Bring Chloe to you in your perfect timing. And I pray, Lord, that her spouse and Ethan's spouse will glorify you to the day you return. I pray that there will always be a Vicendac, maybe not in name, but definitely in spirit, sharing the free grace message until you return every day. Why? Because I'm zealous. I'm zealous for people. Are you? I care. I care. You know, it might have been something that happened to me when I was an unbeliever. I was bragging to a co-worker at the, at the, uh, the railroad factory I welded railroad cars at. I was bragging. I wasn't saved yet, and I said, Hey, you guys, I was bragging to, to all of them. Hey, you guys, tomorrow night I'm going to be going to downtown Chicago there, get some Polish sausage stuck in my aorta. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. That was on Saturday night. But anyway, got Polish sausage. There you go. Okay. No. Okay. I said, I was bragging at the, it's Thursday night, and I said, tomorrow night I'm going to go, and my girlfriend and I are going to go down to downtown Chicago, and we're going to see, yes, I've got like sixth row seats, and they have going to have a stage that's going to be turning. So I'll get to see the guitar player, then I'll get to see the bass player, then I'll get to see the drummer. It is going to be awesome, and you're going to be sitting here. While I'm sitting in the air-conditioned Chicago Stadium, you're going to be sitting here with your smelly leather uh, welding outfit on, sweating bullets in the middle of the summer, and I just wanted you all to know that, and, you know, I was bragging big time. I was, you know, like one-upping them about how great I was and how cool I was. And, you know, I just thought, well, you know what? One of those men, he didn't say, yeah, you know, and spit on me. He, he knew the Lord, and he had a heart. He was zealous. Guess what he did? He went home that Thursday night, and he told his wife, uh, um, let's see, what was her name? Louise, yes. Louise, I know her maiden name, Vanderhoof. I can't remember her first name. Anyway, but Louise, he tells Louise, Louise, I'm not going to be eating this weekend. I'm not eating tomorrow. I'm not eating Saturday. I'm not eating Sunday. Because I'm so scared this kid's going to go to Chicago and he's going to be taking drugs. He's going to be smoking marijuana. 
And you know what? He's going to get in a wreck and he's going to die and go to hell. And so he fasted and prayed for me. I got saved about two weeks later at the factory. And after I went to his apartment with him, this little tiny apartment in Dyer, Indiana, he pointed to the place and he said, Bob, right there is where I kneeled down and I wept for your soul. I kneeled down and I wept for your soul. I said, Jim, thank you so much. Thank you so much. He's still pastoring in Florida. He's still just going forward for God full steam now 42 years later. I love him. I go down to preach for him from time to time. Uh, you know what? We're like this, and we barely ever interact anymore, just like on special occasions and stuff. But you know what? We're so close. We could call each other like that, and like, it's like nothing's ever changed, that we're still the best of friends. There was a book written by a man named Malcolm Gladwell, and I'm wrapping up everybody. He tells the strange story of a man whose name was Christopher Langan. Christopher Langan. He was a genius with a staggering IQ of 195. Now, if you want to know what kind of IQ that is, okay, listen to me. Einstein's IQ was calculated to be 160, and the average human IQ is uh, 100. It goes between 80 and 120 for re average humans. His is 195. It's off the charts. In high school, Langan could ace any foreign language test, listen to me, by skimming the foreign language book for two to three minutes, and he could take the test and pass it. Two to three minutes of study and he could open that test up and get 100% on it. What else? On the SAT, what score do you think he got? 1,600. And he fell asleep during the test. Didn't even need all the time, you know. Man, you know, I always laugh because Kelly was a three-time valedictorian. You know, I told you she was an amazing, brilliant young lady and continues to this day to one-up me, much to my dismay. No, anyway, but anyway, I love you. And anyway, but... She, oh yeah, way to go, Bob. Now I lost my train of thought. I should have stayed with this. What was I going to say, Kelly? Do you know anything? Yes, A.T.? Oh, I know what it was. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. What happened was um, she, uh, she was uh, so brilliant and so wonderful when we were going to college together. And, of course, she got uh, uh, magna cum laude or summa cum laude? Do you remember? What's the highest one? Magna cum laude? Okay, thank you. Magna cum, she's magna cum laude, and I graduated one step down, summa cum laude, but I used to joke that uh, she graduated magna cum laude, and I graduated lordy how cum. <laughs> it's so funny, we would be in the same class together like in our senior year of college, and uh, I would come in a little bit later than she, she's sitting there, and she says, you ready for the test? And I said, yeah, uh, I think so. She says, what do you mean you think so? Because <laughs> you know why? She had everything memorized already. And I'm sitting there, you know, I'm like, uh, yeah, I think I'm, uh, I think I'm ready. <laughs> and th see, that didn't compute with her. Either you knew the material completely and totally, and you would get a perfect grade. And, you know, that's the way. Uh, so anyway, I was, Kelly, you were rubbing off on me, but I was, it's taken a long time to catch up, you know. And so thankfully, 40 years later, I think I may have got close. All right. So. Anyway, we're talking about uh, Gladwell, 1,600 on the SDA, SAT, credible intellect. They said the sky was the limit for him, but, 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 when everything was said and done, when everything was said and done, he failed to take advantage of his exceptional gifts, and he ended up working on a horse farm in rural Missouri. Now, again, nothing wrong with a horse farm. But if you have an IQ of 195, shouldn't you try be like, like M Madame Curie and try to discover uh, uh, you know, radiation <laughs> and uranium? and everything, you know? Shouldn't you be using that brain to do something like unbelievable, cure cancer? And he's working with horses. L uh, Gladwell said he never had a community. Listen to this. The author said he never had a community a group of concerned people to help him capitalize on his gifts. 
just wanted to be by himself. Gladwell summarizes the story of Langan in one sentence. You want to know what that sentence was? He boils his whole book down to one sentence, and here it is. Langan had to make his way alone. And no one, not rock stars, not professional athletes, not software billionaires, and not even geniuses ever makes it alone. And he's right on the money. He's right on the money. And praise God, we learn today in this strange you know, have you ever thought before, wow, why does Paul do this? Why is he talking about all these people, all these names at the ends of these epistles? Why? I just told you why. The theological take from that is this. You can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. So let's bow our heads for prayer, everybody. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, Father, I know that I've come across a lot stronger than I usually do, Lord. I know I've kind of pointed my finger in people's faces and poked them in the chest and said, why is this like this? Why are you not honoring God the way you should be honoring him and following him the way you should be following him and glorifying him the way, but I do it already, Pastor, I glorify. No, you need to be doing more and glorifying him the way he intended, not holding back, not uh, just frittering life away. Oh, Father, oh, Father, oh, Father, we pray together that you'll help us to lean on one another, to be strong in you, to take our Bible fellowships and small groups and ladies' Bible studies and in, in another month, our men's prayer breakfast, to take it seriously, to be, be there consistently, to be there when the doors are open, to be glorifying God and growing and helping Ridgepoint Fellowship to blossom and to reach unbelievers heading for a Christless eternity because of that circumstance. They are without Christ and without God in this world. Father, we just cry out to you for your grace. You're working, Father. The question is, will we? The question is, will we? And Father, we pray this in your precious name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for bearing with me. You know what? I was kind of like a prophet today. <laughs> I'm usually the teacher, but I was prophesying today. <laughs> but you know what? We need it. I, hey, I need it. I need it just like you do. I'm, I'm a no different human being than you are, all right? So I want you to have a blessed week this week. Question. Who will you bring? If you're watching from afar, who will you bring with you next week? Who's one person, a friend, a coworker, a relative? Who is that person that you could invite? Think, who is it? Is there somebody you could bring next Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning to this amazing, hey, a free breakfast. We're going to cook breakfast for you, glory. Bert, Polish sausage. No, I mean pork sausage. <laughs> I wish it was Polish. Hey, get the, Terry, get the Polish. Okay. Anyway, but you know what I'm talking about, Bert. And you know what? You all know what we're talking about. It's good. It's going to be great. Pancakes and the whole thing. But you know what? Let's bless others. Let's get other people to come, okay? And I love you all. I want you to have a great week. You that are tuning in with us, have a great week as well. And we'll see you very soon. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great week.